February is Black History Month, and we're starting it off with a discussion with Deb Rucker of Stitches of Heritage. The show focuses on the role African Americans played in the history of needlework and how they are contributing today. This week's show is sponsored by Sassy Jack Stitchery. You can recognize Black History Month by stitching a free Rosa Parks portrait sampler from Sassafras Samplers. To download your free file, go to sassyjackstitchery.com and scroll down on the home page. Click on the link and download the free PDF file. While you're at the Sassy Jacks website, sign up for the Cosmo Thread Club and join the Sassy Jacks Customer Loyalty Club. You can also order your favorite Nashville market charts on the site. Keep checking back. More new designs will be added as we get closer to the market. Make Sassy Jack Stitchery your local needlework store at sassyjackstitchery.com. Thanks to the folks at Sassy Jacks for sponsoring the show. And now our conversation with Deb Rucker of Stitches of Heritage. Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr, and you are listening to Fiber Talk, the twice-weekly podcast for needlework artists. Our artist this week, from Stitches of Heritage, Deb Rucker. Deb, welcome. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you for doing this. Uh, our topic this week, uh, I, I like the term that you used, Afrocentric. Yes. Yes. Uh, so we're, we're going to talk about Afrocentric, black African-American needlework, um, Deb's experiences, which uh, uh, you've got some experiences, and um, uh, and just learn and get get a better understanding of, of what that type of needlework is and uh, where we can find it and how it works and so on and so forth. I'm most curious on so, some, so many fronts here, so I appreciate you doing this. I'm so glad you said experience. You know, at, at my age, it's just like I got old lady thoughts and old lady history behind me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, that's really good. I like to think that and that's the good part about this. I feel I'm experienced, but I feel I have so much more to learn. Yeah, you know, I'm sure it's endless. Yeah, yeah. Well, it is for all of us. Yeah. So just give us a little background about your needlework. Been doing it a while. Just do cross stitch. What uh, what what do you do? So I've been doing it uh, a while. Cross stitch in itself, I've been doing since mm, early or mid nineties. Mm -hmm. um, and because that's when I discovered it. Um, I'm trying to think, it may have been when I was down south in Louisiana. I used to travel a lot for my job, and I found a needle workshop down there that had just all kind of subjects. And that's when I picked up my first uh, pamphlet that was, uh, I think it was distributed by Green Apple Designs, but the pamphlets themselves were called uh, the Southern Roots series. And it was fantastic. I was like, my first time seeing someone that looked like me uh -huh. in a cross stitch pattern. Um, and so I asked the the um, the owner of the, the thing about them and she told me about that actually Green Apple Designs was the only one in the United States whose distribution covered uh, you know, African American designs and charts. The those charts were done actually by a couple of sisters, um, Jean Bowers and Jeanette Powers, who were not African American, but lived their whole life in the South. Really? So, yes, yes, they lived their life in the South, and I always loved. They had said that every one of them says that you know when you open the the booklets it said. It's a representation of our history. Huh. And then it said it was talking about a lot of the things that you'll see in their designs don't exist anymore. And this was in the 90s. But they hoped that you would love the people as much as they do. Hmm. And when they said the, a lot don't exist because they were doing things like the wash lady, the uh, blueberry pickers, basket weavers, newsboys. Okay. who in that day and era, what they were designing, were black people. Mm -hmm. So um, that was my first intro into it. And I'm like, oh, and then I, I'm sure I was back. Was I on YouTube back then, Gary? 
because I'm trying to think of how I learned because I kind of taught myself, uh -huh. but I imagine I was watching YouTube videos or something like that. It seems uh, a little early for YouTube. I don't know. Was it? Okay. Yeah, 90? So, yeah, it might be. Well, so, I'm, a, I'm a reader at heart, so yeah, I may have just found... That's probably you know, how you did it. ...guidebooks to, to do it, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm a reader. That's how I learn, reading. Yeah. Well, it, that's so interesting. Did you ever get to meet those two ladies? No, I did not. And I know both of them have since passed away, but uh, one of them, I don't remember if it was Janet or Jean's daughter still designs cross stitch but she does because they had a whole um line of beatrix potter oh. and it was very interesting the like just the range of things that they you know they did they had so many booklets um but their daughter is still doing uh, oh. cross stitch booklets that's great and different subjects so so the, it's so interesting to me because you know you, you hear uh, well, people talk like movies and TV shows that are about women, and then the comment will be, yeah, that that's about women, but you can tell that a man wrote it. Yeah. And so, you know, to, to have uh, needlework designs by white women about African Americans, they must have done a heck of a job for you to connect with it and feel like it was representative. Yes, and we'll talk about later about, you know, how to shade things and color. the dimensions of their characters were fantastic. Yeah. Nobody is all one color. You know, it's they it was just absolutely fantastic. I don't think I had ever seen anything like that. Um in today's day and age, I'm starting to see it more. Uh -huh. But I think that's because a lot of things are uh, like computer generated from pictures. And so you get all the shading, you yeah. know, kind of in there and stuff. But their designs were so ultimately realistic. There were a lot of them that didn't have facial features and that kind of stuff. But, you know, they were in positions of, you know, like a, my favorite one, the wood chopper, which is a uh, an older black man. And he's, I can't remember, is he sharpening? or just looking at his ax in his hand. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you see every detail, huh. every detail. I think I've stitched him at least two times. <laughs> I have a lot of those that I haven't stitched yet. I just started collecting them. I was gonna say, you got them all, huh? <laughs> I don't, and surprisingly enough, uh, because as you can imagine, they are all now out of print. Yeah. In fact, Green Apple Designs doesn't even exist anymore. Um, you can find a lot of them on eBay, uh, but a lot of them, and I don't like to do that either. I want the actual pamphlets. A yes. lot of folks on eBay are doing the thing of Xerox and a copy of the chart for you or something like that. But uh, yeah, I, nope. and I think the last time I looked, um, one of the charts, and it's one of my favorites, I think it was book two that had the gospel lady in it. And whereas, you know, the original one, I want to say maybe it was... Three ninety five or four ninety five is now like fifty to sixty dollars. Oh my! Oh. Yeah, <laughs> and the few that are on Etsy that people have stitched and are now selling are selling them for well over a hundred dollars. Wow! Yeah. 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 No, don't don't buy Xeroxes. No. Uh, yeah, that's just absolutely crazy to me. It yeah. really is. Copyrights are there for a reason. Yes. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. So that got you started, and, and you just didn't stop? Uh, I didn't stop with the cross-stitch. Yeah, <laughs> I've gone on. I do, I guess my earliest thing was I learned how to knit when I was in Girl Scouts at the age of 12. Mm -hmm. So I knit and, and crocheted before I, you know, even got into um, the, the rest of the needle arts. Yeah. Um, so I did that while I was young. Um, yeah. And then... Yeah, then came cross stitch. That was right after that. Like I said, I must have been in my thirties by then. Um, then well, cross and if you're stitch, traveling, needlework is is a great evening killer. It really is. It really is. <laughs> yep. And I lucked out. I have to look. I know that cross stitch shop is no longer in New Orleans, in Louisiana, but the owner was so nice because I told her my interest once I'd found that one. I told her my interest, 
and she did a call out to all the different uh, distributors to see what things, you know, what charts existed with black subjects in them. Uh So, yes, my library is full. I have a (laughs) lot of Southern, you know, a lot of the jazz kind of things, a lot of Mardi Gras, you know, a lot of anything. And she just, she would find them for me, let me know. Next time you're in town, I have a group for you. She took care of you. She took care of me. That was wonderful. That was wonderful. Oh, that's great. Uh, New Orleans, you know, people... People, a lot of people complain about that. It's it's one of my favorite cities. You can keep Bourbon Street. I could care less about that. But exactly, uh, once you get off that train wreck of a street there and get out and see the culture and the the architecture and oh, I just love it. Yeah. 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 And it's, even outside of the city, yeah, our yeah. project office was in Metairie, and that's actually where you land when you know the airport is in Metairie out on the. So I stayed in that area a lot, but. Like you said, so much history, yeah. uh, uh, so much the design and the details of everything down there. I just absolutely love. I've, I've worked on that program for 19 years and loved every year of it because <laughs> I got to travel back and forth there. Yeah, yeah I got to I, I was I used to travel a lot and, and a lot of conventions in New Orleans. And uh, one time I went to visit someone who lived in the bayous and you know, be, like below sea level kind of thing. And I was driving and all of a sudden I had the radio on it, it. All of a sudden there was just no signal. And and I thought all I could think was I'm so low below so, sea level. I can't even get a radio signal, but, exactly. uh, <laughs> but you know, the, the way the, the landscape changes and the culture, it was just fascinating to me. Yeah. Yeah, and there was oh, it was that's right. The guy, the guy was Vietnamese, wow. and he and there, it just so happened that there was a a festival, Vietnamese festival, uh, that weekend, and he took me to it, and introduced me to Vietnamese food, and laughed at me because I couldn't eat it with chopsticks and or whatever. <laughs> No, I don't know. It was chopsticks. It, whatever tool they used, I couldn't do it. You know, so he called and got me a fork and spoon. But, <laughs> but yes. uh, yeah, they know fascinating. how to do a festival right down there. I tell you. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Great stuff. Great stuff. So all right. So so you you obviously uh, found <laughs> this lady helped you uh, uh, find needlework that appealed to you. Yes. D- does does that then generate your interest in history and and doing research? No, the history and the research came way way after. Okay. In fact, that's like my look. That's my most uh, recent. Um, what do I call it? Not an obsession, but kind of an obsession. It, it can be an obsession. But that's all right. I, I've fallen down that rabbit hole. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, but it started with me. I. There was an article that was called um, Six Samplers in the National Archives. And it was samples of American schoolgirl art. And I'd never even heard. I was like, oh, this is interesting. And one of the writers that has actually has a book out, uh, Betty Ring, she had described and researched a sampler from 1832 that had was embroidered from a church, the AME church, uh, African AME, I should say, an African AME church. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and that sent me down the rabbit hole because then I started really looking for stuff. And I found that... Um, there are so many of the African free schools, um, I want to say Baltimore, Philadelphia, I think even Rhode Island, uh-huh. um, in a lot of the states had these African free schools that would actually, they were charity schools for black children, and they would teach them to sew, knit, and mark a sampler. Mm-hmm. And when I first figured this out, I'm like, I don't even know what mark a sampler is. Yeah. Because mainly because I didn't have um, an interest in samplers. And to me, those you know, that's things done on the plantation, and right. I'm not putting my effort into all that. Yeah. Um, but then, 
why the reason these girls learned it and they taught it in these free schools because that was a way for them to get a job, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and I shouldn't say a job. Before they were giving them jobs on the plantations, they would learn to mark tablecloths and pillowcases and everything for the mistresses of the house. So, 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 that, so that's the samplers then served the same function for freed black girls that they did for girls in Europe in the 1700s then. Yes. Same function all over again. Yes. And, you know, for them, you know, it was a way to advance yourself because, as we all know, back then it was illegal for blacks to read and write and, you know, learn to read and write and that type of thing. But all of this was going on. And, you know, I can only imagine in my mind, you know, the girls were learning it. But you're teaching your mom and dad. This is A, B, C, D, E, F, G. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, yeah. there has to be a correlation between what they were learning and how uh, the blacks at that time were learning alphabets right. and stuff. And uh, the oldest one. Well, let, let me let me let oh. me back up. S- okay. s- save that. Hold on to that one. T- okay. You know, a bunch of dumb guy questions here. OK, because mm-hmm. uh, yeah, because I don't know a lot of these things. Um, help me out when when we had uh, enslaved blacks. Yes. And then uh, then obviously uh, freed. Mm-hmm. Is there is there needlework from enslaved blacks that that we have, or was was that not allowed? How how did that work out? I am so glad you asked this question. Because, and we're going to talk about um, what was back then the Woodlawn Plantation, which is now the Woodlawn and a big Pope Leahy house. Yeah. Um, they have just released the name of five enslaved women that assisted Nellie Custis, who was an avid cross stitcher, um, which is how they came up with you know this whole program of annual needlework shows. But they have the first names of the five women that assisted her in cross-stitching. So, of course, they never got credit for it at that time. All the credit went to Nellie Custis. But the fact that they have gone back and researched and found the names of the five women. So at the last needlework show, someone did an original design, which was with the name of those five women. Hmm. So we we do know. So now, now now they're visible to us. Now they're by first name only, of course. Yeah. They don't they don't have last names, but by first names. But that's just five of them, and I would contend that that didn't just occur at Woodlawn, that that occurred on other plantations mm-hmm. where they were the ones stitching and, and doing all kind of things um, for, you know, the folks that were in charge there. Yeah. So, so, so I, we and, and I think we uh, are, as time has gone on, discovering more and more the uh, the contributions that blacks made, enslaved blacks made, that for which they received no credit. So this is oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. and and we won't even jump into the the whole sixteen nineteen um, thing. When I came here, I'm in Hampton, Virginia, right at Fort Monroe, and I went to. It was the 400th anniversary of when the first Africans landed in Virginia. Mm-hmm. And it's the marker is here at Fort Monroe. Um, they landed here at Fort Monroe two days before they landed at Jamestown. Well, on that day, I was walking around with mouth hanging open because every school book and the, what I had learned, you know, in school from elementary on, right. that Williamsburg, Jamestown is where the slaves landed. Mm-hmm. Come to find out, no, Hampton, Virginia, Fort DuPont, uh, Fort DuPont, I'm sorry, Fort Monroe is where the first landing was. Couldn't even get that right. <laughs> yes. And it was merely a stop for them to trade. It's 20 some odd uh, Africans that they traded for food and supplies here in Hampton. And the good wait, part let, of let's, that. Wait, wait, let's, let's just pause on that. Okay. So. So 
human beings yes. traded for food. Yes. And supplies. Wow. You know, whatever they whatever they needed. Food and supplies. Uh. Oh. So and it's amazing. Fort Monroe has has a entire uh, history museum with you know all the records from the ships from it's just it is amazing absolutely amazing um the other thing that i've learned to kind of gear my brain to um because a lot of people oh they bought slaves from africa no sir they those people were artisans they were farmers they were blacksmiths they yeah. were professional folks that they brought to this country that, as you're saying, that helped build the country, right. you know, right. They, they now have the pictures and the records at the Capitol of all the blacks that built the Capitol. Right. I'm like, this they, is yeah, just, they wanted the skilled people to do the work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Nice. So this, and the skill wasn't learned here, you know, it was bought here right. with them. Right. Yeah. Do the work, get no credit. Yeah. Yep. Get yep. No, get no credit, live in miserable conditions. Yeah, all those things. Yeah. Nice. Nice. So so the the enslaved women girls who did needlework, basically because of that approach, we know very little about what they did. Yeah, the most information that's out here is for um, you know, the era when uh, the blacks first started getting free and um, the the actual um, the six samplers in the National Archive that I talked about earlier, they were schoolgirl art and it was from 1700 to 1850s. Uh -huh. um, so it was early on and I mean, the records are very complete for that. Uh, yeah, I was sad to learn here in my area. Um, the school itself was in Williamsburg, um, but they, and I can't remember what point in time, they destroyed that school, but they know that there was a number of schoolgirl samplers that were made, you know, in that school Yeah. Um, that no longer exist. Uh -huh. Now, so, were, were these freed, so, okay, so we put the enslaved part behind us here, yep. the, the freed girls... In the freed schools, were were these schools uh, owned and run by white people, or were they black people teaching black people? They were charity schools run by, um, most likely, I'm trying to think of all of them were, yeah, they were charity schools that were run by a lot of the um, church-related organizations. Okay. You know, that did not believe in you know, slavery and and all of that. So they opened schools, excuse me, uh, uh, mainly in the Northeast and as far down as where I am now in the Southeast um, to teach the, the black children to read and write and also included things, you know, like knitting and cross stitch and, mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff because that could become a trade for them. Yeah. So no, uh, no, no freed schools in the in and I get the best term is the deep south. No freed schools there. They would have, would have had to move north. Not that I know of. The okay. ones I've seen discussed the most have been in the north. Okay. Yeah. Um, and actually the and that was for the girls teaching was you know knitting, sewing, crocheting, cross stitch, embroidery. For the boys. Interesting enough, it was teaching them sailing and how to read the stars hmm. so that they could work on ships and, and do things. So I was, I'm just, I was amazed. A part of history I just never yeah. knew about. Huh. Wow. Huh. So, okay, so, so, we, have, so we have samplers. We, we don't have many samplers, though, from these freed schools. So there's a young lady. Um, Kelly Rains Barnes, that has done ex oh, extensive research on all of this. And um, I have, she did a dissertation on all the black uh, schoolgirl work mm -hmm. that went into a lot of detail. And just this past November, um, she did a talk at, um, oh, 
I'm trying to think of which museum that was, at one of the museums up north, and she's identified over 30 samplers done by schoolgirls. Okay. I think when I first start looking at them in, in 21, 22, there might have been less than, I know it was less than 20 at that time, but they're finding more and more now. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, my best thing at the Philadelphia retreat that I went to um, this past fall, I got, that was in Philadelphia. I had a chance to go to the American Museum of the Revolution or something. Um, and they had this, it was a well-to-do black family out of Philadelphia whose two daughters actually cross-stitched uh, work. And my, my thing was, you know, I've read about it so much, I want to see one or two in person. Mm -hmm. And they actually had three of them there. And I was the one standing there with, you know, once again, jaw dropped, <laughs> looking at these amazing samplers, you know, in, in their truest form. Yeah. So that was a highlight for me, for sure. Now, what are these samplers like? Are they essentially copies of uh, what we, the samplers that we see everywhere, or did they have a a black, uh, an Afrocentric uh, flavor to them? No, not at all. Okay. Because a lot of the girls that were um, being taught these samplers and doing these samplers, a lot of them are like Quaker, you know, ah. samplers because mm -hmm. the Quakers were really heavy in teaching. Um, those kind of things. So a lot, most of them that you see are different motifs, different flowers, you know, always the alphabet, or not always, most of the alphabet and, uh, and numbers. So they were like standard yeah. sampler themes, but with uh, like the Baltimore ones, you would see the buildings were yeah, Baltimore architecture. Yeah, yeah. So, and, okay, so, so these girls were being taught just, just as white girls were, these are tools to learn skills yes. that you can, so you can work. And, and that, that's universal. You know? Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's good that they're finding more. I'm going to have to hunt down this at Kelly Rains Barnes. Yes. Yeah. Um, and also there is, um, when I was researching, Emma Finkel and daughter, they yes. actually sell samplers and they keep a complete history on all the ones that come, you know, within their world. So you do find a lot because to me, that's the greatest part is reading the background of the samplers. Right. M, M. Finkel and Daughter does a lot to tell you the history of the folks after they learned how to cross stitch and how they went on to become whatever they would become. And I find that very interesting. You know, it's good to know how they started, you know, cross-stitching. And it just makes it more um, closer to your heart when you know, you know, they got married and moved on. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, some of them were high society in Philadelphia and did a lot, did a whole lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great website. I've spent, uh, yeah, plenty of time there. Mm-hmm. Yep. I'm hoping one day to have enough money to buy one of those samplers that comes through there. <laughs> oh, to buy an original? Yes. Yeah. Oh, that would be wonderful. Yeah, yeah. So in, in your research, what, have, have you, there's got to be some surprises you've come across. I mean, obviously this, this stuff is, is, I'm sure, exciting and enlightening to learn uh, how this, you know, that, that black girls were giving these, op were, well, given earning these opportunities um, but some surprises, some things you didn't expect? Um, I think my main surprise, there was one by a young girl, Mary DeSilver. She was eight years old in 1793. That is the oldest one that they have on hand. A lot of these are in museums around the country. Uh-huh. But the fact that an eight-year-old, and when you look at the sampler itself, it's like, oh, my goodness, <laughs> eight years old? Yeah. yeah. Makes me feel bad at 66, <laughs> I tell you. Um, but that, and yeah, like I said, in the stories behind what the folks went on to become and to do and contribute, I, I really 
really like that. Yeah. Um, now, of all, all of these, if there are 30 of them out there, there are only about, I want to say, half a dozen that have been reproduced. Oh, okay. So the, the main source of those is the Oblate uh, Sister School, and they were Catholic nuns that moved, uh, that came to Baltimore, and they ran a whole program of teaching girls how to stitch. Mm -hmm. And I think it is, what is her name? Barbara Hudson. Yep. Queen, Queenstown Sampler yep. Designs. Barbara, you She's bet. She's done a couple of gorgeous reproductions of the Black Girl Samplers. Yeah, one of our favorites, Barbara. She's amazing. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. the newest one that's been reproduced is Rosina Dizzery. That was done by uh, Arlena or Arlene Cohen. Um, she just released that. That may have been 2022. That's a recent release of one. Mm -hmm. And so she got the reproduction rights to do that. And um, she talked on her floss too about going to the museum. And they allowed her to take all the time she needed, you know, to take all kind of very close up pictures of that sampler to reproduce it. And she did a, a wonderful job, mm -hmm. a wonderful job. Yeah. And um, I have that one. But, you know, the minute I look at one and see, one over one stitches and whatever, <laughs> 36 or 40 count. I'm like, oh, let me save this one for later. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that, that's the one thing about uh, reproduction samplers that, and I, I do them. I just finished one, a, a nine-year-old girl. Um, is you know, they, they stitched them on basically uh, thread counts that were like bed sheets to us. Yeah. And uh, over one and you name it. And, we as adults can at times struggle with these things. And these little kids are just, yeah, banging them out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think yeah. my other favorite, there was one that was being sold uh, in this area from R&R &R Reproductions. That was Melissa A. Smith. And it was done in Norfolk, Virginia. And it's in the Norfolk Historical Society. I would love to get permission to go in and see it personally, too. But uh, Melissa was 12 years old mm -hmm. in 1850. Yeah. Um, so that's the only one that I've stitched. And I took some leniency in, <laughs> in my <laughs> stitching and of doing that one. But just, you know, just knowing that it was done by a young black girl just makes all the difference in the world to me. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's about 30 then. Okay. There's about 30. Right. And the good part about that, uh, Kelly announced when she did, uh, that's what it was, Concord Museum. They hosted her for that one. And she's writing a book about all 30. Oh, excellent. So pretty soon I'll have all the information and history I need. There you go. There you go. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So tell tell the story. I We, we talked, uh, for people who are listening, uh, Deb and I talked for a long time here several weeks ago. Tell the Woodlawn story about uh, the gospel woman a piece. Oh yes, yes. That uh, that story, I it it, oh, it just won't leave me. Um. So my first experience with once I had cross stitched the Gospel Woman, <clears throat> excuse me, which was a uh, um, Southern Roots. I was so amazed at how it came out. It was my very first one, and I I took it to Woodlawn to enter into their annual needlework show. And um, at that time, one of the, the local needlework shops was handling all the, the entrance for them. And I walked in and, you know, told them I'd like to, to enter this. And the woman just looked shocked. And she was like, well, this is inappropriate for our show. Hmm. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Um, Ugh. so I, I went away. My mother actually took that and hung it in her house forever. Um, fast forward to 2021, the Woodlawn show subject was, um, actually hindsight 2020. And I started working on a design for, for them. And I'll tell you about that, that later. But I had an opportunity to talk to um, the the young lady that, you know, handles all of that for them, you know, takes in. Because they don't have it. Um, I think if you mail in your entry, that that same needle workshop, side note, 
now owned by a different owner. Um, they take in the mail ends, but Woodlawn accepts it, you know, at the door themselves mm -hmm. for one weekend. And I was talking to her and she asked me, is this your first injury? And I relate to her the story, you know, of back in the 90s and everything. And and she was surprised, well, she was surprised or shocked. I don't know which way to explain it. And, but then, you know, she told me, you know, what they're about today and, you know, the times is as they were. And she did offer for me to um, bring that one to show it with Lon, but not a part of the needlework show, just as, you know, they would like to, to display it. Yeah. And, and I chose not to. Um, that was, you know, in my mind, the perfect piece at that, that time. Um, but so much has happened toward then. And the fact that they were doing a show about 2020, I just went in a, a different direction. Um, and, and that piece is here in my home because my mother has since passed away. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm not taking this anywhere, you know. <laughs> Just like she kept it for all those years, I'll keep it for all those yeah. years going yeah. forward. Yeah, not not appropriate, but it sure is in your house with your family. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's As my stays. first piece. Yeah. yeah. As my first piece. Yeah. Certainly can understand that. Yeah. But but yeah, I mean I, I suppose you uh, at the time you I guess you can understand, but still it hurts. Yeah. And let me say, Gary, you know, since then, and in talking to the young lady that runs it now, at that time, they were only accepting samplers. Oh. So, which is why now I applaud them, because the last year's Needlework show had to be the most diverse show that I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Yes, they still have, you know, a lot of samplers, but my gosh, they have so much more. Yeah. They oh, have great. so much more, and that's the, the fantastic part about it. That's great. So, um, so talk I, talk about the diversity part in in needlework. I mean, you know, obviously, it's a, a predominantly you know, as as a minority in the in the needlework world as a male. Uh, you know, it's predominantly white women uh, uh, hobby or art form. Uh, but is diversity getting better? Are, are you seeing more uh, black, Hispanic, uh, um, males? <laughs> you know, <laughs> males and females, Gary, males and females. And I think you know, yes. To answer your question, we definitely are. Um, and I kind of feel like 2020 was the turning point, you know, for all of that. Mm -hmm. um, or. 20, I will say 2020 was certainly the turning point for me in seeing all that. Um, that's kind of the breakout year. And I have to go by what's in Instagram because that's my my premium way of connecting with other cross stitchers and and designers and, you know, seeing what's out there and everything. So um, for a long time, I think everybody knew if you didn't have the green apple design, you know, with the black people, that was it. Um, and it's not like that anymore at all, mm -hmm. at all. Um, a lot of the newer designs are computer generated, but then you have people, um, shaded stitchery on Instagram has to be one of my favorite ones for black culture and positivity and inclusion. And I just really, uh, enjoy her designs and she is a young black girl which I love it's like preserving the art you know mm -hmm. but giving it a twist yeah so yeah. I like that and even I want to say uh, not more than that but a part of that is just all the different cultures which is like I when I first started and the stitches a heritage thing Sure, I had in my mind, you know, the black culture and, you know, our place in it and everything. And then you meet like Marumi Designs that she's showing you architecture and heritage for Iran. Mm. Mm -hmm. There are, there are, with all the stuff going on in Palestine, there are Palestine designers. There are, 
it's just crossing all cultures. And that makes me very happy. That yeah. does make me very happy. Uh, at this point, I have so many of the black culture designs, my own and others, that it'll take me the rest of my <laughs> life to get to, you know, any of the others. But it's it's good knowing you have the choice. Yeah. yeah. You know, you, it's now it's now a choice. Um, and I do enjoy a lot of, how should I put them? Uh, I do stitch other than black designs, but there aren't many. I, yeah. I will admit to that. I um, mean, it's a time uh, thing because I'm like, if I'm going to uh, spend my time doing it, and I'm one of those crazy people, if I once I finish the design, it has to go up somewhere in my house. So if I'm showing it and I'm stitching it, um, I do want it to be, you know, related to black culture. Yeah. Um, but there are there are others. There are others. There's some very good designers out here. Help me understand now. All right. Th this is ultra dumb guy question here, but help me understand what it is about designs, black culture designs that makes them different. It, it can't just be changing the skin color. There's got to be more yeah. to it than that. What what are some of the aspects or elements of the art form that makes it a, a black, an Afrocentric design that says to you, you need to stitch that. Um, for me, I love the historical type designs. Okay. Um, when we got our first Supreme court judge, you know, you know, the first vice president, it's just the historical things that I personally like. Um, but a lot of the designs, and you mentioned the fact that there are, you know, it is more than just changing the skin color. Right. Um, the, I will go back to Shaded Stitchery because um, she's about the music of the culture, um, if you will, TV shows of the culture. Um, she just, she designs things that touch you in the way that you're like, oh, I remember that, or oh, I love that show, or oh, you know, so it it is, it's representation, but it's also inclusion. Um, because even in this day and time, the fact that we're still reading and seeing the first African American in any <laughs> category yeah, is yeah. very sad. Yeah. Yeah, it's very sad, yeah. but it is what we're experiencing. But we also have to go back to uh, the culture and the history and what's been done over time. Right. And like we were talking before, the um, the thing, the contributions that have been made that folks don't know about. Right. Yeah. That. Yeah. That. That whole is the first African American to achieve. You name it. Yet yes. Now it shouldn't even be. A designation. If if we were doing it right, it wouldn't even be a designation. It would just be another person who achieved at a high level in whatever and, it is. And we will disagree on that one because I am a firm believer in representation matters. There are still a lot of very young, you know, as in children, that have never seen the black representation. So seeing a black vice president or a black Supreme Court judge kind of instills and cements for them that, you know, I can do that. Yeah. Well, see, and, and, and I, it didn't it didn't come out right. But what, what I meant was that that should have happened. All of that should have happened so many years ago that that now these kids would not be seeing it, it would be just a normal thing. Right. Yeah. Right. No, I think and we. I think you and I agree. That's everybody's yeah. hope and wish. Oh yeah, we do. Yeah. That's everybody's hope that this would have happened before now. Right. And I don't even want to give it to now because we have so far to go. Yes. So let it continue to happen to give to recognize those that always should have had recognition. You know. Right. Just amongst everybody. Yeah. No. That's that's my point. Is many many yes. years ago the first should have all happened and yes and then now it's it's just 
uh, yeah, people who achieve. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and I will say, I add on to that, and don't let it stop happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is I'm talking personally, my belief. I am so upset about the taking history out of the school books and oh. you know all of the reversals and that kind of stuff. Yep. What are you doing to our children? Right. And right. when I say our children, it's fine. You don't want your children to learn it. I want my children, grandchildren, great grandchildren to always have access to history, to everyone's history. Mm-hmm. So and, you know, I get disturbed by that now, but I, I'm not going to jump on my <laughs> on my soapbox about that one. Calm down, calm uh, down. <laughs> But yeah, but it is a part of that, you know, the actual representation part of it. Uh, it's culture, it's representation, it's a, it's a lot to it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm happy to see the progress and, and looking forward to seeing even more. Yeah. Well, I, I, I have a sense that there is, is real momentum these days to... Uh, More than there ever was before. Yes, you're right about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I look at... Uh, the the women who were in the space program that movie whatever it was um yes is, is a is a, a prime example of giving people who made a difference and were just shoved back into the you know into the back room because it was the white male that had to get credit and yeah. uh uh you know bring these people forward so we can appreciate what they what they accomplished in in whatever endeavor it was yeah yeah so, so you're like me, Gary, because I have a whole list. Uh, the Black Cowboys. The Black, uh, there are so many that deserve recognition. Yep. Uh, so there's. I have. Uh, my daughter's laughing at me. There's a whole listry, uh, laundry list of designs that um, are on my to-do list to bring <laughs> forward. Um, that kind of thing. Uh, and and it, a lot of times when we had talk about, oh, you know that things that people haven't heard of. But I go back to the Negro Leagues in baseball mm-hmm. that, you know, you may know, you know, what is it, Satchel Page and, and a few of them, but my gosh, there were so many teams and so many men that were never recognized. Right. So, yeah, oh, there's, that, there's still a yeah. lot out there. Oh, so. the, the, I'm sure the stories you could tell about the Negro League ball players would go on for years. Yeah. Uh, amazing talent, never got credit, and doing it for the love of the game. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. And Satchel Page, oh, he was he was the stories you hear about him, he was something else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The the movie The Harder They Fall, which was about the black cowboys. Uh-huh. Um, when I watched it, I'm like, oh, you know, I enjoyed the movie and I'm like, oh, this is great. And then I think somewhere I read, oh each person is based on a real person. So then I start researching <laughs> all the people that were in the movies. That well, you I got it bad. You of. really got it bad. <laughs> now, I have to admit, see, my mother was a librarian at uh, Fort Belvoir for 30 years. So uh, my my history and my point of reference is going through the card catalogs. <laughs> my mother wouldn't answer questions for us. She's like, I answer questions all day long. You want to find something out? Come on to the library and I'll, you know, go through the card catalog and Look it find up. what you need to find. <laughs> yep. Yep. So now, you know, I'm ecstatic that there is an internet. <laughs> yeah. That I don't have to go anywhere. I can sit down and research everything I want to find out. Yep. Yep. Probably the best thing she ever taught you. Go look yes, it up. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> go look it up. Yep. Go find out. Yeah. Yeah. So let let's talk about you know we, when we talked previously we talked about two basic types of needlework designs and one is the representation and the importance of that and then there's the more artistic things but that representation thing you really educated me when we first talked about how important those mainly word based designs are to the black culture Yes. A lot of power there that, that I didn't appreciate till you had shared it with me. Yes. And a lot of the word type things, you know, everybody knows the words of Martin Luther King and Maya Angelou and, and some of those, but there's there's just so much. I, there, 
there's so much. I don't I don't know how much more. Um, I'm trying to ferret out the the amount of things that are out there. Um, but I think, like you said, it's getting better because we see we are yeah. seeing more and more yeah. of that kind of thing. And the more and more we see, the better and better that it gets for sure. Yeah. Well, it what hit, what struck me is in, in talking to you, and this is where you really educated me. Is you know when when we've had these these uh, uh, police things where where a, a black a young black man is killed. And mm-hmm. uh, and then you would hear in the protests, you know, say their name. Yes. And I, I understood that uh, to a point, but I you know, I didn't really get it till we first talked, and then I really understood it, the importance of that representation, mention saying the name, uh, and make you know making that individual visible, and the importance of that, and it goes back to all the people who who created whatever all the black people who never got recognized and and you, you really educated me on on how important it is to to have the name out there so that that uh, recognition in whatever form is is given yes so um the, our discussion then was a big part of that was the woodlawn 2021 show mm-hmm. where i decided you know not to do the gospel lady so my entry at that forum was, uh, it was called um, Black Lives Matter Protests. And I went back to, again, researching. Uh, online, there is a site that lists uh, back to the, I don't know how far back it goes, but uh, every um, life that was lost, basically, to either racial injustice or systemic racism and I think that was my my most difficult cross stitch piece ever because my approach was it uh, to it was going to that website and writing down the names and I did not write down the history but I read uh. that person's history you know in the circumstances of how they were killed. And mm-hmm. so uh, that one went very slow. Yeah. Uh, the final piece that I submitted to Woodline uh, had roughly 50 names to it, and it was stitched on um, a printed Constitution linen. So the freedom and justice for all is up there, and the we the people mm-hmm. is at the top. Mm-hmm. Because that was my whole thing. We are the people, too. Yeah. You know, like everybody else. And all of these folks that you see did not have a chance. Um, for that piece, I think it ended up being, ooh, was it 16 by 18? Mm. But the Constitution linen was well beyond that. What I did was actually folded up the linen and put it behind the submission, you know, in the frame, but hidden with the backboard. Uh Uh, Because my plan is actually to undo that and take it down, uh, press it flat. I'm sure it's it's very wrinkled by now. (laughs) Uh, Press it flat and continue with the names. Yeah. Yeah, because sadly there will be more. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there are. I, I didn't. 50 names were nothing. Yeah, I want to say that site even at that time when I did it back in 2021 had five to six hundred names, Ugh. and like you said, there have been more. Yeah, since then. Well, see, and and that's where that's where I uh, that conversation we had. I, I have to tell you, it has been with me ever since. Um, uh, I because I, to a person just walking up to that piece in a room, you know, go went to see the exhibit, walked up to that piece. Okay, th- this this person stitched a list of names. That's nice, and then they move on. But when when we hear you tell the story, and then I, I'm imagining the emotions that must have gone through you as you're stitching each name, knowing the history. Yeah. The 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 depth in that piece 
is huge. And and not just that, when I walked into Woodlawn to show, which that was probably my second trip to Woodlawn. You know, I dropped the piece off, then I came back to see the show, and I walked in the front hallway, and I looked up, and mine was right in the front uh, hallway, oh. like the first thing. And for that, it actually won the Director's Choice Award for Storytelling of Art oh. in that show. And I also got second place uh, for Cross Stitch in the Adult Division as an original uh, design. Mm-hmm. So my mind was blown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it was really blown because, like you said, what was going through my mind, I am a black woman at a plantation cel- celebrating Black Lives Matter protests and supporting BLM. So the pride that I felt at that moment, on top of which I had my two children and my two grandchildren oh. with me, was I I don't think I've ever felt anything like that since then. Yeah. Um, I do continue to submit to Woodline because, you know, they've gone from it's inappropriate to I love those guys there, I tell you. Um, (laughs) So I've done a, um, once again, back to the research. Uh, I met a young lady here, uh, Miasia King, that she's stitching in color on Instagram. And we met because our names, Stitching in Color, Stitching in Heritage. Uh And we started talking. And the funny part was she lives four blocks, or she lived four blocks down from me. We never knew each other, Uh never met each other, (laughs) met online. We started stitching together. And so we started um, just looking at uh, things done over time or items, and she was a quilter. And she introduced me to um, the book, and I think it was uh, Stitching in Plain Sight, that talked about the quilt codes that were embedded in quilts. Oh, yeah, yeah, the Underground Railroad. The Underground Railroad quilts. Yeah. Well, I'm not a quilter. I hope to get there, but I'm not. (laughs) So my... 2022 piece for Woodlawn uh, was actually eight of those quilt codes uh, strung on a wash line with the green apple design of the washerwoman with the the pot on the ground, Mm -hmm. you know, being what, and a tree on the end. (laughs) So I was that, you know, down that rabbit hole of the, (laughs) the underground railroad quilt codes. But um, like I said, I continue to submit to them. Um, I continue to love the historic nature, you know, of all of yeah. that, too. Yeah. But yeah, 2021 at Woodlawn was the, my favorite year oh. yet. Yeah. That, that moment never, never to be matched again. Yeah. yeah. And, and I know it won't. Yeah. I know it won't. Yeah. And um, I have not, after that first year, I have not won anything we're going to say so far. But it doesn't matter. I tell people all the time, the experience of exhibiting your needlework in itself, that well, that changed me. I think it would change anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it makes you a better stitcher. Mm-hmm. Um, just getting that exposure and getting to see your items exhibited different places. Um, after that first one, I was sponsored here in Hampton by our Creative Reuse Center, where I bought a lot of supplies from there. I love that sustainability aspect of crafting. Yeah. Because uh, I'm I'm a crafter that oh let me try you know this needlework element, <laughs> and I can go there and spend money and not feel guilty right. or you know spending the entire check and stuff. But they sponsored me at Slover Library in Norfolk to do a presentation of what they call heritage stitching. Mm -hmm. So it's everything that we're talking about here um, and how it started and the history of things that were out there. 
I think for that first presentation, there may have been maybe 20 folks that were present, which was, you know, well, I'll say surprising for me, but, you know, I was happily uh, surprised. But talking to all those folks afterwards, and I think it's the talking to people and the education of folks of what's out here that I enjoy the most. Uh So I've gone on to, uh, I've been at Slover since then for each of their Black History Month um, shows, their Juneteenth shows, um, the Norfolk Visitor Center actually housed all of my designs uh, for 30 days in the lobby. Mm. And so all the visitors that came to the Norfolk Visitor Center um, got to see everything that I've done. So, um, so it's been a, an amazing opportunity and one that I'm very, very grateful for. And that's great that you're actively sharing this. Yes. Yeah. Because, yeah. yeah, you could just do it for your own enjoyment, your own education, and keep it inside the house, and uh, no one would be the wiser. But, uh, yeah, it, it get, educate people. Yeah. Yeah. And I used my, I used my Instagram as the tool online because um, even under the highlights, like I've put all the schoolgirl samplers together. So if you want to see what all of them look like, the 19 or so, I don't have the full 30 up there, but I have about 19 of them, I think, or so up there. And the same, I do the same thing as we we're talking, the new designs that come out that have black representation of some sort in it, black culture. You know, I highlight all of those at, at, online. So hopefully, you know, and uh, people know where to find stuff if you want to look at it. Uh, I don't mind doing the research. I was groomed for that. <laughs> <laughs> Not only groomed, but you didn't have a choice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. All right, we're going to run out of time here, but you turned me on to a website that has already sucked up more time than I uh, had at the moment, diversityandstitching.com. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Wow. <laughs> yes. Uh, and I want to say, if I have my years corrected, they stood that site up in 2021. And who the talent that is yes. on there. And as we discussed before, it's not just uh, black culture and talent. It's nope. all cultures. It is wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, that uh, site inhaled me. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and, and not because of, of whether they're black or gay or whatever. It inhaled me because of the talent. Yes. And the, the diversity is it for me on there. Yeah. But, but because... yeah, so much culture and so much, there's so many aspects of needlework from all different points of view and all different cultures. Yes. It's just fascinating. Yeah. Yes. It really, really is. It really is. And, and it's growing and it's growing. I go there all the time to see, you know, what's new and yeah. who is new and, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. I, I really enjoy that site. Yeah, no, that's a good one. And you have a section there. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I do. Yeah, I do. Wow. All right. Thank you. We got to stop. Darn it. All righty. We, we're going to have to do another one. Just gonna yeah, have we to. talked about a lot today. But yeah, you're right. We'll do another one because yeah. I have. Look, I have more to to show and tell. <laughs> I know that you do. I know that you do. <laughs> All right, Deb, thanks so much for uh, for doing this. Really appreciate your time, and thanks to everyone for listening. 